Hey everyone, and welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. My name is Lucas, and I'm the founder of Ergogenic Health. Together in this podcast series, we will go underground to explore cutting edge health and human performance insights that you simply cannot search on Google to help you upgrade your existence. So without any further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today's guest is an entrepreneur and regenerative medicine pioneer who's making breakthrough medicine accessible for everyday people. His mission is to help more people access the future of regenerative medicine by providing affordable, accessible, and non-invasive cell banking. Drew Taylor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Drew, maybe let my listeners know a little bit about your journey and how you got so fascinated into, I guess, regenerative medicine and stem cells. Yeah, well, I, it goes back a fair bit. I'd have to say all the way back to grade seven, we had a science fair at our school and uh, we had to pick something mechanical and essentially break it down and present it as our science fair project and do some kind of, of demo with it. And I chose the total knee arthroplasty. So it wasn't a very popular choice. I am for sure the only person that did it. We had a few people choose the guitar and a number of other things, but I went all in on a fake knee, basically. Um, And through that process, I was really lucky. My father was a physician. And I think in that day, probably things were a little bit different, but I was able to actually get an audience in the OR, obviously keeping uh, my distance. And it was something that they uh, they did very safely, but I got to witness a surgery. And so this was a a pretty momentous uh, occasion in my life. I remember every detail, like walking through the double doors, the smell of the iodine and all of those different sensory, you know, kind of explosions going on. But it was really like this amazing introduction into the teamwork that went on inside that OR. All of the nurses, the physicians, the surgeons, everybody working in unison, laser focused on on what they had to accomplish and their role in that team. And so I fell in love with uh, healthcare and delivery of healthcare for individuals in that moment. But the thing that actually resonated with me was the next day. I actually got to go back to the hospital and do rounds with the physician and the surgeon and got to actually go and visit that patient that they had operated on the day before. And when we went into their room, the patient actually stood up out of bed and embraced the physician. They were like overjoyed, obviously, with emotion because, you know, obviously probably meds were still wearing off from the surgery the day before. But for the first time in a long time, they were able to actually stand up and move even more freely. I had watched that patient the day before get brought in on a wheelchair. And so this was a pretty cool moment and definitely very emotional. And we were walking away from that and I was expressing that emotion to the surgeon. I was just saying like, wow, I like this is, I've never experienced anything like this, obviously is in seventh grade. And I just said, this is incredible what you've done. And, you know, they said, yes, it is, you know, it's really exciting. People get an amazing benefit and quality of life from this operation, but that patient was relatively young. And so unfortunately, they did require the surgery. What we put in that implant won't last forever. And they will be back probably in about 10 or 15 years and require a revision surgery. And of course, we'll have less bone stock and it'll be more challenging. And they may probably will require a third one at some point. And so at some point in that patient's journey, they're unfortunately going to be back in that situation. We're not going to be able to do anything for them. And then they said something that was pretty wild at that time. And we're going back a few years, remember, but they said, you know, in the future, and what you'll see is us, instead of putting metals and plastics, we're actually going to give a patient back their own cartilage, their own bone. We're going to be able to regrow the tissues that are worn away and degenerated with age and give that person a chance to have their own knee, which allows them obviously to continue to do all of the things that they love doing and be active. And so that was the first time I think I'd ever really heard of regenerative medicine. And of course, that word wasn't even used in that conversation. But the opportunity really to take our own cells and tissues, right, and confer benefit in other areas of our body where we're deficient. That was my intro to regenerative medicine. And after that, I was hooked. Incredible stuff, Drew. What I'd like to dive deep into, I guess, is like the different types of cells in the body and which ones in particular you're talking about that are responsible for this regenerative effect. 
Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard about stem cells. You know, it's definitely a hot topic and stem cells is an amazing, you know, class of cells really, because we use the term stem cells to represent a lot of different cells in our bodies. Every type of tissue in our bodies actually has their own little deposit of stem cells that feed the greater population of cells there uh, with renewal and regeneration. And ultimately, you know, we can classify them a little bit more precisely. And so if I can take a moment, what I would say is cells in our body are actually more like a mountain. You know, you have that magic moment at the very top of that mountain where sperm meets egg and that cell has the potential to become any single cell type in the body. And it does, right, as the fetus develops. At the bottom, around the ring of that mountain, the base of that mountain, we have all of the end cell types, cells that are definitively serving a purpose and have a job in our bodies, a skin cell, a heart cell, a liver cell, a kidney cell, every different type. Well, we have stem cells or what we call stem cells that are not only at the top, but also kind of halfway up that mountain. And they can become a multitude, and we call those multipotent cells. And we have many of those as we become adults that have, you know, populations still in our bodies. And they have the potential to become multiple cell types at the bottom of that mountain. And so we really think about stem cells as this kind of catch-all phrase, but it really represents a bunch of different cells that have different areas of potential in our bodies and, and different potential to become a multitude of, of types of cells. Mm. So I guess then, Drew, when it comes to, so you just sort of outlined the different types of organ-specific stem cells. Maybe let's look at how has this evolved over time, like as far as mm. things that have been known to stimulate stem cell production or how have we gone about actually recycling or reusing them? Yeah. So obviously it was, it was pretty evident with the miracle of life that the potential of that, you know, magic cell, right? Singular cell when sperm eats egg and it, and it becomes everything in our body. So we've been, you know, at least witnesses to the power of what cells can actually do. Um, beyond that, it's taken some time to really explore and fully understand all of the different adult stem cell populations that exist in our bodies. And one of the most commonly referred to ones is mesenchymal stem cells. And mesenchymal stem cells are cells that we know reside in our bone marrow. We may have, have heard people talk about that, but there's other pockets of those types of cells in our body. And one of those areas is actually in our hair follicles. We've got mesenchymal stem cell concentrations there. And so we focused a lot of our work uh, around the hair follicle because it's such an accessible uh, area of our bodies, right? You can pluck hair follicles and actually access those painlessly and non-invasively. And that's in the last number of years where we've seen really an explosion of work uh, and excitement around the potential that these cells have for actually being used to recreate um, different tissues and different um, you know, things that our body needs. And so I think that the journey of, of how we're gonna experience regenerative medicine is gonna be uh, um, you know, an ongoing one. In its infancy right now, we're already experiencing the benefits of regenerative medicine in a number of different areas. Um, and a lot of it's actually happening in the world of aesthetic medicine. And so aesthetic medicine tends to be on the frontier of things and, and trying out new things. Of course, uh, as a human race, we definitely prioritize appearance. Um, that being said, um, the skin is also the largest organ in our body and keeping it healthy and robust. And, and uh, a lot of the things that are, are great for, uh, for aesthetic medicine are also great for wound healing, diabetic foot ulcer, venous leg ulcer, a lot of other conditions um, that are quite serious. Um, and so a lot of the area is really trying to use elements of our body, these, these stem cell populations that reside in our bodies to help wound healing, skin rejuvenation, skin regeneration, even hair regrowth. Um, uh, a lot of wound healing, of course, um, both, both uh, post-elective procedure and after trauma. Um, and so that's an area where we're seeing a, a, a large amount of work and, and Acorn is actually really specifically working in that area as well. Maybe it's worthwhile walking us through like the process of like, let's say, you know, extracting the stem cell from the hair follicle, like walk us through that process. Like, does it take a number of weeks to do that or yeah, yeah. You know, how does that work? Yeah. So the, the hair follicle is a, uh, an amazing resource and why I love it is because it actually checks a lot of boxes and, and it really sets it up to be the ideal candidate for a cell type uh, in regenerative medicine. The first thing is it's got a lot of different cell types inside it. 
So you've got two different germ layers, right? The surface skin, uh, the ectoderm, right? Uh, are keratinocytes. You also have uh, deeper down the fibroblasts, right? Like below our, our, our dermal layer. And, um, and there's some really exciting work around fibroblasts, but you also have this concentration of mesenchymal stem cells in the hair follicle. And then at the very root of the hair follicle, you also have this cluster of cells that has, again, you know, multipotency and, and is an adult stem cell. And so all of those different areas in the hair follicle all can serve different purposes in regenerative medicine. Um, what, what is really exciting is, as an example of, of what we can do is pluck hair follicles from the, from the back of the scalp, you know, pretty simple and painless. Uh, and then in the laboratory, we could actually culture out those cells uh, and allow those cells to produce a number of the things that our skin, unfortunately, gets deficient at producing over time. Collagen being a very good example, we produce 1% less collagen every year of our lives. Uh, hyaluronic acid follows a very similar path and we're at about 50% production before we even hit 65. And so these things, you know, that really, you know, start to drop off is the reason why we get fine lines, wrinkles, we see the droopiness, right? The sagging of our skin and all of those things that, you know, pretty much um, we're all trying to, to fight. You know, gravity definitely gets the best of us over time, but it's because we lose these essential elements of our skin. Well, the stem cells in the hair follicle are, uh, extraordinarily proficient at producing these. And mm. so we can actually use uh, your hair follicles that have been plucked and use them almost like a farm, right? That in the lab, they're used to culture out and, and release many of these, these elements, uh, these macromolecules, matrix molecules, growth factors, and harness them for you to deliver back to your skin so that you can maintain those levels and, and actually rejuvenate your skin and its performance. So that's an example that takes, I would say, less than a month to actually create those that, that for you. Um, right now, we've done a number of preclinical work uh, around that. And, and, you know, on the early side, about two weeks, on the later side, about a month. So I'd imagine the, um, that process there would, only, would have to be the person's own stem cells. You can't reuse it for anyone else's body. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so there's a few different um, thoughts around this. And I think that there's even, um, you know, what I would say is if you have your own cells, that is always the best. And the reason why is because you are not going to reject those cells or potentially components of those cells or react negatively against components of those cells. Um, and Traditionally, if we are using donor materials, transplanting an organ, uh, especially the skin, because so many different contact points with our own cells, uh, you're putting the patient on immunosuppressants. And that inherently comes with its own risks. You're essentially lowering that patient's immune system, which leads, leaves them very susceptible to, um, you know, common colds developing into severe pneumonias. And, and I've certainly in my career witnessed patients that that has gotten the better of them. And so, you know, it's, there, there are very big risks to that. When you have your own cells, you will completely adopt them. Um, it's your own material. There's no need for immunosuppressants, um, and you're not going to reject those cells either so that you've got a chance to receive benefit from them. Um, allergenic, which is you know receiving donor cells, right? So autologous is, is when it's your own material. Allergenic um, uh, therapies, I think, are, are very exciting. Um, there's certainly a lot of work going around them. We still have some massive hurdles to solve before we can safely have uh, allergenic therapies. And I think that allergenic therapies are going to be very useful in certain areas of our body that we would describe as immunoprivileged. So we don't have as high of an immune reaction against one of those areas if, is, is using hard structures like bone. So we can actually take bone from a donor, decellularize it, you know, get rid of, of um, the cellular material inside and use that hard structure. You're still receiving another person's component, right? Um, or body part, but you're removing some of the things that, that has a severe reaction against it. What about as far as um, delivery mechanism? I'd imagine majority of this would be through injection, but are there other ways that we can reintroduce these back into the body? Yeah. Well, we're, we're only kind of on the tip of the iceberg of, of regenerative medicine because ultimately um, even, 
even when we think about um, what's happened in the last 10 years of our ability to manipulate cells, we can now take a hair follicle cell and turn it into bone, cartilage, fat, nerve cells, right? You can reprogram it into behaving like an embryonic stem cell using a really exciting Nobel Prize winning technique um, that allows for you to create other cell types. And we've done that in our lab by creating pancreas cells from the hair follicles. So you, you end up having all of this at your disposal. And really, it's now about that exciting time. We have the tools, finally, to, to actually you know, make some great things. Um, and we're in that period of time of regenerative medicine where we're starting to see the patient application, the actual therapeutics, based on, on the access to those tools, start to come to fruition. Well, let's, that's exciting because I'd love to, I mean, the classic quote is like um, the pancreatic beta cells can, it's, it's impossible for them to regenerate or once they're dead, they're dead forever. Um, okay. Let's look at some of the, um, the broader applications, you know, other therapeutic approaches, um, therapeutic diseases that um, we can, you know, apply this, this particular therapy towards. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I kind of, you know, sharpen my tools back in the day in orthopedics. And so we can kind of start there. And what we were doing was trying to regrow cartilage, right, from a small sample of a patient's cells um, so that the idea was we would be able to resurface joints with a patient's own cartilage. Wow. So in, in that, that same thing that I got introduced to in grade seven, right? Um, we're now trying to take a, a patient's cells, regrow them their own cartilage so that we can resurface their joints and fight off things like, um, you know, whether it's focal lesions, whether it's um, traumatic damage, whether it's osteoarthritis, you know, that pain in joints, which is a massive problem. Um, what, we, what we really experienced during that process and what I learned, because my role joining that group was actually um, to take some very successful animal studies and translate them to human models. So was, I was working in the division of orthopedics at, at Mount Sinai. And ultimately, when we looked at... Um, different ages, we had a vast different response from those individuals and our ability to regenerate cartilage for them. Mm. And so it became never uh, more true in my mind that unfortunately having uh, access to younger cells was going to make all the difference for patients. And that's a huge problem, right? Because when are we actually seeing patients? They're coming to us at a time of need, right? And so at that point, what we're learning through that work that we were doing was that we're probably not going to be able to help those patients that do have end stage disease that requires the intervention. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we're actually seeing them in the clinic, um, it's almost too late or it is too late. And so we need to be thinking about things a little bit in advance. And so the idea of trying to like layer in a, a preventative mindset around intercepting that aging as it happens became our mission. All right, so the idea of actually taking that biopsy younger in a patient's journey, trying to get ahead of two things. One, that onset of disease that causes that acceleration of damage. And two, age, right? Which, which is obviously just, you know, so slow trickle of age-related damage throughout our lives. Mm. And so by getting ahead of that, it really opens up the opportunities um, for what we can do. Now, we've chosen the hair follicle because we can do so much with it. And it is such a prolific cell type that allows us to, to have so much potential across creating different cell types. But we looked around, right? And even in Toronto, where we were working, you know, there was a group down the hall that was trying to engineer kidneys and growing miniature kidneys in the lab. There's a group in Tel Aviv that had already 3D printed miniature human hearts, right about the size of a rabbit's heart, but from human cells had the ability to beat and, have, and pump blood. And so these technologies are coming very quickly, but that problem still exists of us sitting back and saying, well, when we get these patients to come into a, to us with a problem, our response may, may be, I'm sorry, like, yes, you're a fantastic, you know, applicant for this and, and you'd be perfect recipient, but we don't have the starting material because the big difference in regenerative medicine versus, you know, pharma, pharmacology is we're not sourcing a chemical. We're not just worried about purity and manufacturing that chemical in the lab. We're actually, that starting material is it's not those, those chemicals or the substances, it's your own cells. Yeah. And so therefore the end product is only going to be as powerful as the cells that we have access to. Yeah. So, you know, the, the future top to bottom, right? Every organ system, every cell type, you know, the ability to, to regenerate those, that, that work is ongoing and coming. Um, and ultimately what we've really tried to, to spearhead is to make sure that um, people actually have access to it. Yeah, actually that gets, um, 
into an interesting discussion, and that is around um, the the rules and legalities and, and ethical considerations around this topic. Personally, I think this is an, a really exciting area, and I'm, I'm I'm very excited to see further research and development, and particularly around uh, delivery mechanisms. But like, maybe let's look at some of the legalities around that, like country specific. Um, what's it like in the US as far as uh, you know administering this this therapy? Yeah. So, um, you know, things, groups like the FDA, Health Canada, right, and around the world, the different um, organizations are in place to protect patients, right? They're in place to make sure that groups are in check with what they claim uh, a treatment will do and benefit that patient and make sure that any risks are being disclosed. Um, and so they exist for a very grand purpose. And that, that can't be ignored. Um, yes, sometimes it's frustrating that that creates processes, that creates timelines, that sometimes for individuals that are facing debilitating, life-threatening diseases can be very frustrating because they just will do anything to get care. Um, on a population scale, I think that these groups are, are doing a great job at making sure that, that patients are safe for the most part. And, and I think that um, you know as a group, uh, I want to, and, and our group wants to work within those guidelines and make sure that we're delivering care that is above board and approved uh, by the country that's being delivered. Mm. Um, and so right now, um, what is exciting is there are things that you can do, right? And so we're not going to be implanting human hearts in a patient tomorrow, right? Those things I think are on the horizon. Um, and we bucket things into three categories when we look at different applications in our company. Um, the long-term bucket is where um, stem cell therapies and regenerative medicine applications are going to require manipulation of the cells. So changing their cell type, using things like um, inducing pluripotency or applying CRISPR uh, to actually get either disease edited out, the right genes edited in, to modify that cell type, so to go from a hair follicle to a pancreas, right? Um, those things are going to require heavy manipulation, come with more risk, and will take more time to go through those um, trials to ensure that the patient is receiving care that is safe and efficacious. Mm. Um, I look at those things as 10 years out. Um, again, you can get a whole bunch of guesses around these, but I do think that the first ones are probably about 10 years out. Um, that being said, um, you know, I'm one opinion. Some people say they're coming much quicker and some people will say that they're further away. Um, in the middle zone, I think it's a little bit more predictable. It's taking our own cells as primary cell sources. So not modifying their cell type or using things that would edit and change their DNA and um, putting those back into the body as we age so that we're continually renewing our body with the younger version of ourselves um, and, and fighting off not only age, but also uh, the development of disease, right? Those two things are, are tied hand in hand. In the short-term bucket, that's where I think things get very exciting. And that's where we're looking at trying to make sure that within the realm of FDA and Health Canada, we're going to be able to deliver regenerative med medicine applications in the extreme near term. Mm -hmm. And this may not be taking your younger cells and putting them back into you, but it is taking your younger cells and allowing those cells to produce the things that you unfortunately stop producing in high amounts and supplement yourself with your own autologous. So it's, it's all from you, um, growth factors, uh, matrix molecules, all of those things that we need. It is starting in skin. And so right now we've run um, two preclinical trials on the production of a skin uh, treatment that uh, I think has three main areas where it could be really exciting. Um, one is skin rejuvenation, the other is wound healing, uh, and the third is hair regrowth. And um, we're gonna be taking that uh, into human applications uh, early next year. Wow. Interesting when it comes to, um, Drew, I'd like to dive deep into some of the actual claims that some companies have made, perhaps have actually been, I guess, like not, not uh, caught, but maybe like warned, you know, be careful with the claims that you make. Maybe do you want to share what are some of the outrageous claims that some companies have made? <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I mean, like anything else, um, 
you know, any kind of exciting technology that holds a great deal of promise is going to uh, is going to attract a whole wide range of people and businesses. And some of them are going to be operating with the patient's best interest in mind, and some of them are going to be, um, you know, a little bit more devious or 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 untruthful in order to make sales and 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 turn profits. Um, there is a huge industry that exists around medical tourism, and I've seen all sorts of outrageous things. Um, but the claims is not, you know, it, it unfortunately is influencing patients to seek out some of these things. And look at there are fantastic groups that are in other countries outside of of you know, North America or or even in, in other countries where there are less regulatory interventions that are delivering fantastic care. There's also groups that are doing things. Um, for the purposes of just trying to earn profits and, and they make outrageous claims. They convince people that they're going to save their lives or change their lives. And unfortunately, that's not a promise that they can keep. Um, in fact, what concerns me even more is groups that are delivering um, interventions and in stem cell therapies without the proper experience, guidelines, preparation, and knowledge, um, and are actually doing patient harm. Right, so it's one thing when when people are outright um, lying about uh, saving lives or 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 making people better, but not administering anything that can hurt them. Right, there's been cases I've heard of of people actually taking, um, being able to kind of save the last bit of drop of of whatever stem cell concoction was injected in them, and it being found out to be just a salt solution. Right, so I mean, there's there's all sorts of things that you hear about. Um, what I'm worried about is people that are actually delivering care that can harm patients. And I've actually seen some that have gone off for medical tourism to other countries and have come back um, in poorer health than, than they left with. Wow. Well, that's, um, <laughs> that's uh, I guess, really important for the user. I'd, I'd imagine you guys are doing a good job as far as like educating the customer about, you know, what they should be looking for and things like that. Um, before you sort of mentioned the, the ability to even target neuronal cells, um, an area that I'm really fascinated in is like Alzheimer's, um, mm. Parkinson's, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, what has been the, like, um, the breakthrough science in, in that regard? Like what, how have we been able to apply that to those sort of um, diseases? Yeah. Yeah. So Alzheimer's is extremely difficult. It's definitely an area of passion for mine. And I've had family members, including my dad, that, um, you know, it's been, it's been something that, that has affected me personally. And so that's, that's a passion. One. It's also extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, I was really excited to see, um, some protocols come out for the differentiation of neurons into dopaminergic releasing neurons, which are the cells that we lose during Parkinson's disease. Um, that was really exciting work. And, um, it's doubly exciting for me because we were able to replicate that with hair follicle cells. So we've taken hair follicle cells that have been banked for patients, um, pulled them out of cryogenics um, and uh, differentiated those cells into neurons and then onto dopaminergic neurons. And so those types of things are really identifying the ability to generate the cell type that we lose um, is a huge step forward. The next challenge will be in designing the therapeutic delivery of those cells into the site of loss and allowing uh, and in, in doing so delivering them in a way where they will actually uh, take hold and start to pick up the slack and serve the purpose of, of what that patient is in need of. And so I think that, you know, we've definitely made some massive leaps forward. I think some really exciting strategies are, are being worked on and, and I'm really proud of our team for, for replicating that work in a non-invasive cell source that can be stored. Um, obviously, you know, Parkinson is an age-related disease. So yeah. imagine being able to pull out your 20, 30, or 40 something year old cells and use those as the therapeutic cells that to, to deliver that benefit that have not been exposed to that disease uh, and that progression in that age. Um, it's it's going to be a pretty exciting future. Yeah, for sure. What about as far as like, I guess, when it comes to the um, frequency of administration, for example, um, I know you said it took up to three, four weeks for the stem cells to actually multiply in the lab and actually have a therapeutic uh, dosage. What about as far as like frequency of the sessions, like typically, do you want to sort of 
outline? Is it like once a month treatment, once every three months? Things like that. Yeah, it's, it's so variable for what you're targeting, right? For with the skin, um, a lot of, of the best insights for these types of interventions is once a month. So, um, you know, many people that are, are probably listening have heard of PRP. PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. Um, this is the, uh, the act of actually taking a draw of your blood um, uh, from your arm and then spinning that blood down in a centrifuge to separate out the red blood cells from the plasma. The plasma ends up being more concentrated now, get rid of all the blood cells, and it's rich in uh, both growth factors and platelets. And then that can be administered to a site of injury, right? It, and it can help with inflammation, healing, um, recruitment, um, all sorts of uh, amazing activities to, to really enhance the healing process or incite um, other cellular processes. It's used heavily in, in hair regrowth. Um, PRP is regenerative medicine. It's taking part of our body and applying it to an area of need. Um, and so, you know, that is, is something where the guidelines are right now coming in for, um, you know, some people do it, uh, every two weeks. Some, uh, most people are suggesting monthly treatments for a series that includes, you know, up to six months of, of things where you start to see results, you know, usually after the third month. And so it really depends on what you're targeting. Obviously, if you are recreating a surface of cartilage and you are um, putting that and fixing it onto uh, the bone surface, that's going to be a one-time treatment, right? And you're hopefully going to fix that situation and you will rec you recreate that cartilage uh, in the lab before implanting it. If you're injecting uh, cells into the knee, which um, is also one strategy with mesenchymal stem cells to try to incite healing, and especially in focal lesions. Um, you know, that can uh, require multiple treatments potentially to see full effects. It's very effective from what I've seen in reducing inflammation, uh, at least um, for a period of around three months, patients see a, a big benefit. Um, but I think we still have to perfect how to make sure that, that there is, um, you know, fixing of the situation, right? So the cartilage is actually regrowing and those cells are actually taking hold at that site of injury. Those are some of the areas where I think that we need a little bit more, um, practice around yeah and also at the start drew you mentioned um how you got into this whole space and i was witnessing such a an immediate transformation i'd imagine you've seen you know tons more different success stories and things like that i'd love to hear about maybe you know scenarios where their doctor said you will not heal for example but then all of a sudden they've implemented stem cell therapy um Let's sort of explore. Yeah. That. Well, look, I, I mean, stem cell therapy is, is, um, you know, one thing, but even just intro regenerative medicine, right. As I kind of like to, to call it with leveraging PRP, I've seen some, some people's lives changed. Right. Um, and again, PRP is very variable, right. Cause you take it at the time. Um, it depends on the age of the individual, their general health, because ultimately you're just filtering a patient's blood, right? So what's in them is going to be now just concentrated. And if it's not good, it's not going to get much better, right? Um, but I've, I've seen patients that are suffering from uh, substantial hair loss, um, not in like, you know, the male pattern baldness uh, mindset, but literally um, across the whole head and almost patchy, right? Um a uh, different type of, of alopecia. Um, I've seen them literally regrow their entire head of hair after I think four treatments of PRP. Um, so you see some massive benefits for patients. And again, it's very variable, right? Not everybody gets the same results from it because it's so dependent. And I think that one of the ways that we can try and uh, mitigate against that variability is by locking in our cells at a younger age so they're exposed to less of that disease and damage. And that way, remove them almost from that so that you're starting with a better cell source uh, that uh, should be delivering younger results. Um, that, that being said, um, you know, there, like when we were looking at some of the regenerative medicine strategies from a donor perspective around bone, there was, there was some, you know, amazing opportunities for patients to, to get bone into areas where they had substantial loss. It was inhibiting their ability to ambulate. So they were having difficulty walking because of the angulation that was, was created in, in the knee. Um, and by putting in osteotomies and wedges from donors, you could really correct 
um, that surface and, and, and uh, make sure that they weren't experiencing that loading on, on either condyle. So, um, you know, some of those early applications that I, I got to witness were, were pretty extraordinary. And again, it's the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, these, and I'm talking, I'm talking exclusively about therapies that you can go right now, um, you know, in, in developed countries around the world with, with stern regulatory bodies and receive that care. Mm. Right. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to focus on. Yeah. An interesting area of application that I just thought about, and I'm not sure if there is actually any research in this field, but that is like um, from the athletic performance side of things, as far as like muscle growth and or fat loss, <laughs> is there any potential application there or is it? Yeah. Not- <laughs> yeah. I think there absolutely is a lot of potential there. Fat loss is a little elusive because I think that's an ongoing battle that has a lot to do with, with, um, your lifestyle. Right. Um, and, um, you know, it's the same thing as if you give somebody a treatment that is going to help like liposuction, right. They can go out and, and recreate the situation for themselves. Um, so those, those things, I think behavior is probably the, the best prescription. Um, all of that being said, um, you know, and again, it's all about patient desire and what they want. Right. And, and so, you know, you, you giving them, a, a um, advice to follow to, to achieve what they want. Um, so, I mean, outside of, of fat loss, I think that um, some of the other things around human performance are a little dicey. So I, I was a professional athlete myself. And so I'm, I'm very well versed in, in what's allowed and not and, and follow those things. Well, um, you know, I was a little bit after the steroid era in baseball. So I, uh, I did, I was not an active player during those days. Um, but, um, that being said, when I was working at the university of Michigan, um, in Ann Arbor, I was working in a muscle mechanics lab during my master's. And, uh, one of the discoveries that came out of that lab was, um, essentially this gene that, that acts as the genetic cap on muscle growth and development. Yeah. And so it's, it's the gene that's responsible for telling your muscles, okay, that's enough growing for today. That's, that's stopped growing, right? We've, we've maxed out. And so there is, it, it exists as a mutation in nature where one of those two alleles or two of, or both of those alleles have a mutation where you end up getting these extremely muscular animals. And one of the best instances of that is Belgian blue cattle. And so if you are at home, Google Belgian blue cattle, and you will see the results of when there is a dual allele uh, deletion and there's no genetic cap on muscular growth and development. Well, uh, we did recreate that in mice and uh, it ended up, um, Chris Diaz, this fantastic scientist recreated in the mice and, and it ended up having these Arnold Schwarzenegger mice basically in the lab that were walking around and just powering on the wheel and just like, you know, absolute goons. But what the paper also spent a great deal of time focusing on was the negatives, right? You had an almost guaranteed muscle damage from strains and pulls and tears when you had a double deletion during even moderately strenuous activity. And even with a single mutation, you had a massive higher incidence of injury in those mice. And yet I can remember in that lab, there were emails sent from parents asking if we could recreate that mutation in kids. Oh, wow. So the world is a scary place. The well, world is we were, a very scary place. We're referring to the, the myostatin and folistatin. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's um, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, I'd imagine a lot of people, a lot of parents, even even I get messages on on my Instagram asking about modalities and things like that that can improve the height of their child and things like that. But mm-hmm. actually, maybe I don't know if stem cell therapy would be useful for height. Um, potentially, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, the, 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 as during the growth plate development, um, look, I think that we're going to exist and we're going to have a lot of ethical considerations in the future that we're going to need to entertain because we are going to be able to manipulate our own cells almost like a dial and we're going to be able to make decisions. And certainly in certain places in the world, um, there are people that are choosing their um, baby's gender, right? As a first example of a choice that can be made that is very easy to determine with a microscope. 
So ultimately, I think that, um, you know, there's going to be more and more of those possibilities of making determinations, um, you know, for potentially our children or for ourselves and or our children um, that, you know, bring severe ethical considerations. That's a very, um, it's a really interesting discussion. And I remember seeing lots of like Reddit posts. I used to hang out on um, the Nootropics Reddit forum and that Who came hasn't? up. <laughs> yeah. but like I remember that particular topic came up. It was like, oh, you know, um, what are your thoughts on, you know, what's your stance on being able to control the outcome of your baby, like creating a super baby? Um, what is your, I mean, like, as far as like, obviously you're, you're going to put me on the hot seat right now. <laughs> Go. Um, I, I think the diversity of our planet and, and the human races is one of our greatest strengths. And I think that any time that you start manipulating genes to narrow that, it's a dangerous, dangerous game. Mm-hmm. I certainly am absolutely all for striving forward with science and um, making discoveries that allow us to eliminate disease and allow for people uh, to maximize their health. Uh, I'm also all for maximizing health span, right? So the idea of extending our lives further, I think that that is, a, is an amazing tool um, that, uh, that I obviously am in full support of, you know, being helping Acorn right now. Yeah. So um, all of that being said, um, I do think that when we start to make choices um, like that, it, it is a dangerous game. Um, that being said, right, like, there's an argument the other way, right? People can throw on contacts and change their eye color. So why not just choose it at birth, right? Um, so yeah, I think a lot of it starts to depend. Sports brings up a totally different scenario, right? You know, you, you, can, um, uh, you can think about, you know, the future of PEDs being genetic manipulation, not a drug. Um, and, you know, what would be the difference other than one you have to keep administering and one is just continually happening yeah um you know at least you can turn one off you can't turn the other one off Mm. the the big thing as well with genetic manipulation is whatever you manipulate will get passed on to that individual's offspring so it is permanent and forever in every sense of the word and so when you start to think about those types of changes um, again it brings some very severe ethical considerations Um, And my worry would be is that it takes away from, um, I don't know, the the beautiful diversity of our species. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea why, but I got, I got flashbacks to like Spider-Man, the movie. I didn't know how that, how that. (laughs) Go watch Gattaca. That was one of my favorites. Um, It's a great film. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Okay. So maybe Drew will sort of, um, we'll wrap up soon, but I sort of want to give my audience a chance to learn more about Acorn and, and, and your, the company that you're involved in. Do you want to sort of speak about future developments and where that's leading? Yeah, absolutely. Look, at, I'm, I'm super proud of, of what we've been able to do. We've created the first uh, accessible uh, non-invasive, non-invasive painless solution for, for individuals to be able to bank their cells. And what I mean by bank is actually take a small amount of their cells from just plucking hair follicles from the back of their scalp um, and cryogenically preserve them so that a part of you will never age. And you'll have that as a resource um, for the rest of your life. Um, and some of the near-term applications that uh, that we're developing and, and uh, taking into humans in very short order here are in the world of aesthetics. So skin rejuvenation, hair regrowth, uh, wound healing. Um, but it's a very bright future. In our lab, we have already turned the hair follicle into fat, bone, cartilage, neurons, um, pancreas cells, and we've got ongoing uh, programs right now in kidney, glial cells, uh, T cells. Um, And we're working with some of the top institutions in Canada and now the US. Um, So everything is is fully transparent above board. uh, And and we're working with uh, with academic partners to to create these solutions for patients, which I think is important. And you asked the question earlier, you know, how does an individual really discern Um, you know, which type of company that they would like to work with or trust with their health. I think that's probably one of the best ways to do it is to make sure that, um, you know, the companies, right, the businesses that are 
they're depending on to service their health care are also working with academic partners to deliver that care. It's one of the telltale signs in publishing. Um, so I'm really proud of what we've done. Um, we are available here in Canada already. So you can go to a number of clinicians and some of the top uh, physicians across the country um, offer the ability at their clinics to, uh, to take their, their samples and preserve them with ACORN. We're going to be launching in the U.S. before the end of this year. We already have our first um, partners that have signed on. So we're coming there very, very quickly and uh, hopefully um, many other countries to come. Awesome. Uh, it sounds uh, very exciting. And um, out of curiosity, how many early, adop- I guess, early adopters or maybe like people that have already joined or excited about this project? Yeah. So um, we've got kind of two waves that I would say people in Canada already have access and we've had lots of people come through, right? Um, it's It's been really exciting um, since launch um, in, through clinics this past April. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's been really amazing watching this get into patients' hands. Um, we also have a wait list sign up. So obviously we're not everywhere yet. Um, and so if you are either in an area or a city of Canada that, uh, that we don't have an active clinic in yet, or if you're in the U.S. waiting for launch uh, or anywhere else in the world, you can go to acorn.me and sign up to be notified as soon as it's available in your area. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Well, hopefully there's some plans to you know, bring this technology over here in a, down under in, a, in Australia. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it's exciting. We're, I think we're past the early adopter phase um, and really hitting mainstream in uh, in Canada, at least. And, and it seems that way in the U.S. based on on the waitlist sign-up. So um, I, I hope to be in Australia extremely quickly. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll uh, be sure to leave those linked in the show notes for those listening in. Um, but Drew, it was a great discussion. I'm, I'm actually very excited about the technology and the future of this particular form of regenerative medicine myself. I'll have to create some, uh, some YouTube videos on this in the future, but um, yeah, it's, it's great chatting. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll get down to Australia so we can get you back soon. Awesome. All right. Thanks. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.